I want to take you to 1 Corinthians 13. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been actually exploring the pathway to excellence. And I, I, I know that something in our hearts should say something like, well, obviously the pathway of love is a much better pathway than obviously something like hatred. You know, so we have a lot of hatred uh, floating around in our country, different places. It, it creeps up on us. And uh, so love is way better than hate, right? You know, why, you know that's, that's not rocket science. Why don't we just all do that? But if you hear that message alone, you're missing what Paul is actually trying to say. You're missing some of the finer points of what he's trying to say. And so I want to read the scripture for you again. 1 Corinthians 13. I'm just going to read it in its entirety. Yes, it's a wonderful thing to read at wedding. Yes, it's a wonderful thing to read on your anniversaries. Yes, it's a wonderful thing to remind each other of. But there's so much in this scripture that often is not used and ought to be tapped into as we live our day-to-day lives, as we live our normal lives, rubbing elbows with each other. There's a there's a more excellent way, and it's, it's, it's deeper than just spiritual gifts versus spiritual fruit, or Paul had talked in 1 Corinthians 12 about spiritual gifts, and now in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, he's going to talk about uh, particularly um, speaking in tongues and uh, prophecy, and, and then right in the middle of it, he puts 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 13. But there's a reason why he goes there And I want to trace that down because there's something that this man's heart needs to find in this passage. And I I have a feeling that that I might be among others who might need it as well. So 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 1 reads this way. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal, If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. I'm just going to remind you that Jesus encouraged every one of those behaviors. He encouraged praying in tongues. He encouraged prophecy. He encouraged having the kind of faith that would move mountains. He encouraged that. Now we have Paul here saying, yeah, but there, if, if it's minus something, if it's minus a motivation of love, and we're going to remember that that is actually the love of God, not just your kind of love or my kind of love. If it's missing the love of God, we, we, we really haven't profited much, or anything for that matter. Verse number three, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, actually Jesus commanded a rich young ruler to do exactly that. And if I surrender my body to be burned, Jesus actually said to each one of his disciples, and Peter in particular, you're going to suffer martyrdom for my namesake. If I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Last week I just shared with you, here's what love is. It's patient, it's kind. It's actually patient because it's kind. The love child of kindness is patience. Love is patient, love is kind. Now here's what it's not. It's not jealous Love does not brag and is not arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly and is not jealous. Love does not, whoops, I jumped a line back and went back again. It was so good, I need to read it again. Love is patient, love is kind, is not jealous. We're just emphasizing, I guess. Whenever the Lord says something twice, pay attention, right? Lord, uh, love does not uh, brag, is not uh, arrogant. Love does not act unbecomingly. Actually, that's the one I wanted to read twice. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into an account a wrong suffered. I'm just going to, you know, in, 
in the interest of full disclosure and confession, I've been guilty of all, all of those. I've been guilty in some time in my life of all of those. You may have been too. Now, verse number six, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. I mean, that would be like if I could just send a message to every social media platform out there and just say, I'm just going to just uh, throw this out there is uh, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness but rejoices with the truth. That's the one I want to, so what does love do? That's the one I want to focus on today is what does love do? And, and the simple answer, which is very complicated, I don't want to make it complicated, but it's deeper than we think, that love actually rejoices. Now, uh, in, the, in the Greek language, you've got this one particular word, and it can always be translated as in for, by, or with. So you can be baptized in the Spirit. You can be baptized by the Spirit. You can be baptized with the Spirit. Uh, I don't think we're baptized for the Spirit, you know. But you know what I'm saying? So, there, so one word translated three or four different ways, and you have to be looking carefully at the context to say, you know, like how do we use it? Do we use in or do we use for or do we use by? Uh, in English, that's the problem we have in English. When we translate from Greek into English, so I want to no I want you to notice that love rejoices with the truth. That's in the New uh, New American Standard version of the Bible. If I read ESV or some of the other uh, versions of the Bible, all equally good versions, it it'll say love rejoices in the truth. Now the reason I like love rejoices with the truth is because when Americans certain uh, in certain segments or certain camps if we're kind of leaning towards the group of people who feel like that one of the things that we're missing today is truth like we're living in a time that you don't know who to believe in in the absence of truth it's like you know when you, when I say love rejoices in the truth there's there's some of us that just want to camp right there and not go any further but I like the thought of love rejoices with the truth. I'll just remind you very quickly that Jesus said that he was the way, the truth, and the life. So love has a name. Truth has a name. It's the same one, Jesus. Jesus is the truth. So love, the love of God rejoices with Jesus, with his truth. I don't need to tell you that it, you, you can talk to any number of people and find lots of people today who will say to you, well, that's your truth, <laughs> which means that they have their truth. Say, so, okay, okay, so like, in, in other words, it, like, I, I, I'm not willing to have a rational conversation. I'm not willing to actually consider the claims of Jesus Christ. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put you at arm's length, and here's how I'm going to do it. And say, well, that may be your truth, but it's not my truth which I want to just uh, tell you that that is ridiculous because my truth and your truth is all the same thing. Uh, consider gravity for a moment. Excuse me, we were, we just, before the service, we had to reposition one of the lights up on that ladder. You know, if Doug would have said, hey, Pastor Rich, why don't you just step off the ladder? And I'd say uh, something like, um, but I'll fall. He said, ah, that's your truth. That's not my truth. Just step. He would never do that. But, you know, this, this is how ludicrous it is to say that's your truth, not my truth. I, I don't want to go any further into that right now because we're talking about love. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness but rejoices with the truth. And then some of the most difficult words in this text is bears all things believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And if we hear that incorrectly, we just kind of come up with sort of a, um, a sloppy version of love that love just covers everything. So, uh, you know, when he says bears all things, it, it does have to do with me shielding you from full exposure. Now, I'm not saying that you've confided in me that you're abusing children. 
and now I'm going to shield you from that because love doesn't do that. Love actually brings justice and it brings light. But, but when you're, uh, you're a recovering uh, alcoholic and you share with me, Pastor, I'm struggling, would you please pray with me? And then I see you make a misstep or you see me making a misstep. I put my arm around you, you put your arm around me and, and I cover your shame because I love you and I know that you're struggling with something very, very difficult. My love doesn't excuse bad behavior. Actually, the love of God doesn't excuse bad behavior. But because love is kind and he is so patient, he is so kind to us, he's so patient with us, that we're supposed to take that as an indication of the way he wants to live with us and then what he would say, well, let me just read the rest of it and I can show you. Love never fails. But it, if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away with. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away with. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. Let, next week, I'd like to share about that. I think that all of us understand that when he says that knowledge would pass away, that you know, we're not hoping that knowledge passes away in our lifetime, you know, or tongues or prophecy or any other things. Those things we need. Now, here's an interesting verse to me in verse 11. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. Some people take that as an excuse to, to criticize the gifts of the Spirit, particularly tongues. It's such an easy target. You know, tongues is such an amazing gift. Um, if I could just share my, from my own personal experience this week, I really didn't expect this. It happened to me. So it's my experience. I won't uh, embarrass anyone else. It's just me in the sanctuary here. No one else was here. It's just me and the Lord. And I had prayed through uh, half a dozen or psalms or so, and then I had stepped over towards uh, my left ear, and I started, as I started to walk towards uh, a place where I just particularly uh, like to stand and pray. Um, I don't know why. Well, when it's cold and the heat's on, I like to stand near the heater. That's one thing, you know. By the way, speaking of the winter, uh, Rachel, I don't know if I ever shared this with you, but uh, the most amazing things about birds uh, and their singing, as you heard them today, if you notice, the next time you're in a storm, when, next time you're having a blizzard, you'll not hear any birds singing. They're sheltering pla in place somewhere. Somewhere they're, they're keeping themselves warm and dry, if at all possible. But I have noticed time and time again, when I'm out clearing sidewalks, etc., and the storm is not quite over yet, but if the birds are out singing, that means that they know that the storm is about to end. So when you hear the birds singing, you know that they have the faith to believe that what you're experiencing right now is about to change, no matter what your circumstances are. And that's a prophetic word to someone today. No matter what your circumstances are right now, the sound of singing is a sign to you that the storm's about to pass. So like when I'm out with the snowblower and, and uh, blowing snow and it's going everywhere in every direction uh, and I hear the birds singing, I just kind of grin to myself. This thing's almost done. This thing's almost done. How do I know that? Because the birds came out and they're singing their song. And you know what they said? The song says the same thing. Jesus is Lord. I speak bird, by the way. And they're saying to each other, let's get back to work. We have work to do. Let's get back to work. They have a job to do, and it is their job to gather in for their families every day the things that God has provided for them. That's why Jesus said, consider the lilies. Consider the birds. Okay? We good with that? All right. So, when 
I see this passage and I see that it says that where there is tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will be done away with. Where there's prophecy, it will cease. And then I, I, I see that love never fails. I actually know that that means love won't cease. It, like those gifts will at some point not be needed, but, but there will come a time when that which is perfect has come and, and those gifts won't be needed. But for now, they're needed. So as I'm walking over there, getting a little bit warm, uh, I feel the Holy Spirit speak to me and say, uh, I want you to pray in tongues. And so as I start praying in tongues, just as a sheer act of obedience, I honestly didn't feel it, didn't feel a thing. I, I, I just was, it was just sheer obedience. I'm just responding to the Holy Spirit. Well, let me just tell you, 45 minutes later, the Lord became my Lord again in that particular day. And I, I came away from that saying, my gosh, I, I wish that I could live my life in that kind of faith, in that kind of victory, in that kind of understanding that Jesus is the Lord, like every day of my life. In fact, there's like where I want to start worship. Like if, if, when, when, you've, when you've had a moment, you've prayed in the Spirit, and the Spirit has done whatever He does when we do that. And one of the things I'm certain of Actually, I have a list of uh, 12 things that the Holy Spirit does for us when we pray in tongues. But uh, another day for that. But when I pray in tongues, it, it begins to change not Jesus' lordship, but my understanding and my perception of that. And, and that's what Paul talked about. It builds us up in our spirit. So 45 minutes later, which I had no intention of uh, being obedient that long. I was <laughs> thinking about being obedient for about five minutes, you know. But, but, but it, it, at the end of that, suddenly every problem I was facing in my life had a solution. I didn't know what it was, but I knew that the Lord knew what it was. And there's some of you here today, and I can talk to you privately or you can talk to me, but there's some of you here today and some of you visiting with us online who your breakthrough is coming. It is near. But I would encourage you to contend for it. And one of the ways that we contend for it is by praying in the Spirit. That is one of... The, so you pray until you get the breakthrough. You pray in the Spirit until you get the breakthrough. You pray in the Spirit till you, heard, till you hear the birds singing. And then, you, you know, from there, your spirit is able to rejoice, which is... Can I just ask, let's do this next week. I'm, I'm, it's just a favor for me. I, I, I'm just as human as the rest of you, and I struggle just like all of you. But I want to come in here next Sunday, and I would love to have every one of you here ready to go at the five-minute countdown. And when the five-minute counts down and we go on the air... I'd like us to be already where we were at in the best or the highest part of worship today, already there. Yeah. I want to start next Sunday's service there and go upward. Now, this is a challenge for the worship team. It's a challenge for the support crew. It's a challenge for each and every one of you to come in ready to worship Jesus like he's Lord. Can we? Yeah, why not? We could do it now, you know. But I, I can just feel the worship team saying, please, Pastor, let's not. <laughs> please. Next Sunday, I'll send you a reminder. Can I do that? I'll send you a reminder. Don't forget, come to church when you hear the birds singing. And you'll know exactly what that means. And there's a lot of people that are going to, well, they think that anyways. But okay, here we go. Love never fails, but where there is gifts of prophecies, they will be done away with. I don't think that we need to do with, away with it until we have the breakthrough that we need. I don't think that we need to do away with tongues until we get the breakthrough that we need. They will cease. If there is uh, knowledge, it will be done away with. I think we're going to need that one a while. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. We'll talk about that next week. When we worship with the birds 
When I was a child, I used to speak like a child and think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I put away the childish things. And, and uh, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now we know in part, but then we will know fully just as I also have fully been known. But now faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. So here's, here's what we're going to do. Just a little bit of work today and we'll be done. And we'll go home and have lunch. Some of you are already home having lunch. And the rest of us hate you. <laughs> oh, did I say that? Are we live? The, we are live. I'm sorry. Jim, can you edit that out of the... Uh, it's too late. All right. I'm just standing here thinking my belly's growling. Like, what's wrong with that? I had something to eat. Okay. I believe that... Let me say it this way. There, there's, there's like two things I want to say. One, one thing I want to say, I want to use a picture because I know that so many of us need pictures. We really do, and it's, it's, it's okay. Jesus used them all the time. But another thing I want to say, and this is going to require your patience, your, your listening skills and abilities. I believe that the purpose of let's just say let's let, let's just remove me from the picture anyone who stands behind this we they used to call it the sacred desk you know the podium it's it's a coffee thing you know which is better for me anyways <laughs> anyone who in public worship anyone who's who's in charge of leading a service anyone who is um, given a responsibility and uh, you know we have prophetic words we have uh, um, admonitions or encouragements from the body that's all healthy and wonderful and but I, I think that when it comes to the time when we open the Bible and I, I know this is really pretty old-fashioned and there's a whole generation just can't get it at all I, I understand that and I'm trying to to know how to to do it better, I just always want to do it better. But anytime we break open God's word and we begin to speak or to teach or to proclaim, I believe that the goal of that isn't getting more information from me to, to you. I don't think that that's really the goal. Maybe teaching, maybe teaching is more that way, but when we're proclaiming something from the scriptures, the goal isn't for you to come up to me afterwards and say, that was a great message. And uh, I really needed to hear that. By the way, I'm just human enough to enjoy that. So if you want to do that, you, 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 and especially when we all know it was not a great message, on those days, I really need you to come and say, so from here on out, I'll never know if you're lying or not. But, but, but the goal is not for me to have information, for you to have a need, and for me to communicate to you something that, that makes you better. Actually, I, 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 I trust the Holy Spirit way more than that. And I, I think that in our day-to-day -day life, we're supposed to have a relationship with the Lord that's ongoing and ongrowing. So what is the goal? Why do we do this? Why do we spend some time proclaiming something? I believe that when we've heard from the Lord and then we proclaim that, the goal is getting us, each one of us collectively, getting us saying what God is saying. And you'll never do that unless you love the truth, unless you rejoice in the truth. If I rejoice in the truth, if, if, if my heart, let me just unplug for a minute and just say that that uh, when, when you've lived a few years and you've got experience and you look at people and you look at situations, uh, God help us if we view too much news and stuff. If we go through all of that and you, you bring that into yourself and, and you're trying to process through, through all of that, that uh, what God actually wants uh, us to, to be able to do is not only to filter through the lies and, and love the truth. I mean, that's a, that's a huge thing right there. I mean, can I just say discerning of spirits is a wonderful gift of the spirit to have right now. 
uh, is that a human spirit, the Holy Spirit, a demonic spirit that I'm seeing? But uh, all three of them can sound, kind of look crazy sometimes to me, you know? We live in kind of a crazy world, so discerning through the scriptures and through the Holy Spirit what is true from what is false. Well, let me, let me just say it this way. The goal is not to, to live in ignorance. The goal isn't to say, put my fingers in my ears and say, oh, I'm not hearing anything, you know? The goal isn't to live, go through life saying, I'm not listening to this stuff, therefore I'm not affected by it, so I just want to live in my own bubble. The goal, I believe, of the church and the very reason why the church is still here, the reason why Jesus said, oh God, whatever you do, don't take the church out, Bring, leave it on the earth, I need them here. Uh, the reason he prayed that way is so that those who know him and love him will begin to rejoice in his truth. And when we rejoice in his truth, then what he is saying, we begin to say. We begin to mimic it. We begin, like, let me just give you an example. Last week, I took pains to show you that love is, from the scriptures, love is patient, love is kind. You can go back and view it again if you need to. But if you want to know the definition of love, the kind of love that, that, that is the God kind of love, the kind of love that leads people to live exemplary lives or walk on a pathway of excellent, excellence, you, you start to understand from God's perspective, who is very, very patient and so kind, you begin to say, I want to view my world my immediate world, my family, my workplace, my school, where I'm at, I want to view the world in the filter of agape love, the love of God. So I suggested before, it's best that we are actually in the love of God, meaning that God recently touched me. But if I am not right now feeling in the love of God that we should do what we do, for the love of God. So either way, in it or for the love of God, we should be filtering everything through the love of God, which means that even while you love truth and hold fast to it with a stiff back that doesn't bend, that doesn't turn, that doesn't turn away from the hard and difficult subjects of life, and the things that culture, you don't bend with the winds, you stand there rigid, holding fast because you love God's truth. You hold fast to that the whole while looking at someone next to you or across from you who doesn't love the truth, who doesn't hold on to the truth. They don't appreciate the love of God. They don't appreciate the truth of God. So, so they're living in and according to their truth. It's a wonderful thing when the church can, can hold on to the love of God and experience that and let it heal us so much so that when we look at each other, it, it, our desire is not to judge them because they're not holding on to truth. Our desire is actually that we might rejoice together with every little movement towards truth that they make. I hope that makes sense. Because that's the first thing I want to say. And by the way, um, in our study that we started uh, Wednesday night on, from Romans 10, in there he says that faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. And then he explains it's with the heart that man believes and then it's with his mouth that he confesses unto salvation. That's how you were born again. But that's also how we hear from God something that he is saying. We love it and hold fast to it, and then we start confessing it. So I just said last week I talked to you about love being patient. Love is kind. What if this week, while we're getting ready, we're going to come next week ready to start off from the high point. When, when, th during this week, everywhere you go, no matter what you see, no matter what you think or what you're hearing, uh, could you just remind yourself and anyone that will listen to you that love is patient, love is kind. I believe that that phrase right there oftentimes, in fact, I've experienced it, that, that, that statement will break open 
hard places. When you look at someone and your response to them is not a defense or a retaliation, but it's actually a confession. So what kind of an answer is that? Love is patient, love is kind. So I'm just reminding myself right now that love is patient and love is kind. And for your sake, I pray that you will believe that and you will eventually confess the same thing. What would happen to this country if the church at large started confessing what God is saying? What if we all started saying, love is patient, love is kind? What if when your children make a mess and you look at it and say, oh, they're children, you know? That's funny at first, but after, you know, 15 or 16 years of that and they make a mess, you know, it's like that you kind of lose a little bit in, in that, those years. What if, you, what if we looked at our kids and said to ourselves, love is patient, love is kind? What if you had the experience that I've had? I don't know if any of you have had to deal with customer service lately. Customer service is at an all-time low in my view. And I feel like that I'm a pretty good critic of it because for 19 years I've lived in that, actually longer than that. But, but my goal was not to fix computers but to make customers happy. I believe that customer service is an all-time low because we are so afraid of each other. It's like the customer is now someone who could possibly infect me with something, who could possibly kill me or someone I love, you know. So there's a lot of uh, reticence to be near or close or even to be patient or kind. And so when I call someone and we're talking at a help desk on a phone and we're, there's, who cares if he's wearing a mask or not or I am or not? I mean, there's no way I'm going to give him COVID in Kalamazoo, Michigan. You know, I, I'm, you know there's, there's no way that I'm going to infect him with something that is life-threatening because we're talking over the phone. Why wouldn't you be patient? Why wouldn't you be kind then? Especially since uh, it, the economy has been so tanked by, by COVID and restrictions and et cetera. I'm just saying that if the church, if we just began to carry a confession with us, love is patient, love is kind. If that's hard, then just switch it around a little bit. Just do it this way. God is patient. God is kind. God is patient. God is kind. Actually, it takes you right out of the responsibility. You don't, you don't, all we have to do is confess what we know to be true about God. And, and we can actually be a mess ourselves. So it doesn't really matter where you are on the maturity scale of things. But we can actually we can actually begin to make a change by confessing that God is patient, God is kind. I believe with all my heart that when Paul shared this with the Corinthians, he's saying, you guys excel in spiritual gifts and really I think that you're being immature in it and you really could be much more mature. But one thing that you're missing altogether and that is that this gifts come these gifts comes from the Holy Spirit. And guess what is the source of love in the universe? Bar none. It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the source of the love of God. It's shed abroad. It's poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So he is the passionate lover in the Trinity. Not that the Father doesn't love. He absolutely does. But the Father's attention is really, uh, uh, much of it was directed towards his Son. And the Son's attention was much of it directed towards his Father. And the Holy Spirit is the passion that keeps God a consuming fire, a, a raging, passionate, loving entity. And that love needed to be tested and proven. Therefore, God created mankind, which requires lots of patience and lots of kindness. So there's where we're at, folks. That's the first thing. The second thing is, and this is the picture, 
is so what does it what what does it mean when Paul says look um, love rejoices with the truth I, I think that we could say well it bears all things it believes all things you know endures all th I think that we could use that and that would be a good description of what love does he gave us a list of what love doesn't do and I don't know about you but um, that's a pretty extensive list it's really easy to say yeah that's not the love of God <laughs> you know it's very easy to see something come at you at you and say I don't know where that came from but it's not the love of God but see that's what the world is looking for the world is actually better at our love theology than we are. The world knows what, we sh what they should expect because Jesus said, this is how you'll know that these are my disciples. It's the way they love each other and the love that they have for humanity. It's what caused the early uh, church in Rome, uh, particularly with the exposure of those children, their way of abortion was to lay the children out to, to, to die out of their view. This is a very inconvenient truth. Like we're all about the, the um, uh, casual sex and sex without consequence, sex with each other, sex with anything, all kinds of... And sometimes in the mix you say, uh-oh, there's a baby. What do we do with that? Well, I don't, I don't have time or place in my life for a, a child. So they just uh, abort the child. They didn't have the instruments to abort like we do. So they just bring them to term and they just lay them out in the sun to die. And the church saw that as a huge injustice and a sad understanding of the image of God that every human being, no matter how flawed, no matter how marred or sinful, we still somewhere deep within inside bear the image of God. And so the early church would snatch up those children. The, the vast, vast majority were girls. Sons, much more productive, soldiers, farmers, mechanics, tradesmen, girls. Well, we don't need as many of them because they can't work like men do. So they would put these little girls out in great quantities and the church would gather them up because love is patient and love is kind. The very people that were oppressing the Jewish people who had now become Christians. The Roman babies who are the biggest threat on the planet for the future of their children. The church gathered those kids up and they would raise them in Christian homes and they'd lead them to Christ and they would baptize them and they would disciple them. And those kids would be found serving God. After a while, the Roman soldier, Roman citizen, whoever is the occupier, he's looking for a, a wife for his son. Who had all the wives? The church. So the Roman citizens would start coming to the church and saying, uh, we would like to let our sons marry some of your daughters. And um, because the church was Christian in its, or, uh, I mean, it was Jewish in its origin, there, there's this thing of uh, keeping genealogies separate. And so a Jewish man who is now a Christian would most likely say, listen, I, I can't give you my daughter but I've raised one of your daughters as my own and I love her and so the Christian man brings the daughter out the father of the son he meets the daughter and says what a fine woman and she's so nice and she's helpful and loving and patient and kind and the Christian 
man had the opportunity to say to him, no thanks to you. I found her on the dung heap and raised her as my child. He didn't say that. He would say something like this. It's fine if you want to marry this daughter of yours that I've raised, but in order for us to do that, your son has got to become a Christian because I won't let my daughter marry a Roman who's not become a Christian. Mass conversion of Roman citizens to Christianity, not by all the stories of marching soldiers through the waters and baptizing them, but through, through marriage. Through marriage. Yeah. Yeah. Really legitimately let them marry their daughters and they became legitimate uh, Christians because, um, you know, in the early church you couldn't be baptized right away. You had to, you know, you had to be, you had to prove that you were truly Christian, you know, so. Anyway, the, the, uh, that's a wonderful, uh, it, like it's, it was a, a, a bad injustice that the church saw and reacted to. So, so now when, when, when I read that Paul says when I was, when I was a child, I was very selfish and very self-centered, very, very me-oriented. And I played like children play. You know, they, they think nothing of taking someone else's toys and someone else's everything. But hopefully, by the time that we arrive at the teenage years and the college years, and certainly by the time that we end up marrying, we hope that that men and women have put away their childish ways. And, and they've begun to think about other people. So when now a son begins to think about marrying a daughter, we, we really hope and pray that that daughter would be cared for and loved and not abused and etc. And this is exactly the, the analogy that Paul is using. We, we could actually use the Roman one and say the Roman men and women were foolish in what they did with their children, but the, the, the church was very mature, and, and they were very uh, love of God-minded, and therefore they patiently bore with raising children who were not their own. But I see something in that that, that just to me is such a beautiful metaphor, and that is that um, it's not that Paul is saying that when I was a child, I needed tongues and I needed prophecy. And, you know, he's not saying that. And I know that there's some people who think that, you know. Maybe, I hope none of you, but there's some people say, you know, like that seems to be a very childish thing, praying in the spirit. Like who understands it? Who can get it? Like that, that you know, that's a very childish, immature thing. After all, we've got the scriptures. All I need is the Bible, right? Well, let, let me tell you that, that there's ample proof that Paul had very, he had as much of the Bible as he could have, but he became a, a, a murderous, venomous, bigoted, hateful man in the name of religion. I remember seeing a, a, a discussion between a, a rabbi, a Jewish rabbi, full-blown Jewish rabbi, and, and then uh, there was also a Christian uh, pastor, teacher, amazing, amazing man. And uh, they were on a panel, and they were trying to make some, uh, try to understand hatred in the world, trying to understand the murderous spirit that is in the world, trying to understand um, Islam and the radical version of that that, was beheading people and 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 then and videoing it and making it a public thing, you know, We're trying to understand all of that. And the Christian man was impressive, but I, I got to tell you, the Jewish man was equally impressive. And so the question was asked by the moderator of the pastor. So 
from your understanding, what's the worst sin that you can think of? And uh, this Christian man said, I, 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 I try not to think of it. Yeah, I try not to think of those things. But I, I suppose that, that, that if, if, you know, if someone's a, a serial murderer or a serial pedophile or a serial rape, I, I, th- those, th- those things just, I, I can't fathom them. I can't understand them. You know? And then they t- the moderator turns to the Jewish uh, rabbi and he says, what, what do you think? And he looked at the Christian man and he said, I, I totally understand where you're coming from and I can't think of anything worse than that. I, I can't think of anything that I would want anyone I love to experience that would be worse than any of that. The only thing that I would add is, the, the only way that you can make it worse is if you do it in the name of your God. If you do what you do in the name of your God. And I looked at that and I said, oh, that just, that describes Saul of Tarsus when God met him on the way to Damascus. So what Paul would say to you when he's talking to us first from 1 Corinthians 13, he, he's, he's not just saying that I was once Jewish and now I'm Christian. He's saying I was once so, so uh, infused with truth, but that truth disconnected from Jesus made me a, a raving lunatic and a bigoted man that was hateful and I began to hurt people with my truth. So, so now, by, by the mercy of God and the grace of God, it's more than I've just grown up, but I've come to understand that I'm at a place in my life where I rejoice in the truth. I rejoice in it, but I pray for the grace of God that takes away the, dif- the difference between the truth and you, the truth, and me, the truth, and people that I'm encountering. I pray for the grace of God to take the distance away from us. Great line from a a long time ago, Amy Grant's song. He takes away the distance between the truth and me. I think that when, when we read 1 Corinthians 13, Paul's not just saying, hey, look, let me show you a better way. Everything you do, be motivated by love. I think that's very, that's the shallow end. At the deeper end of all of this, he's saying, listen, you, you, you need an encounter with the love of God. And if you have an encounter with the love of God, it'll wreck you, it'll ruin you, it'll change you, it'll take you places you never dreamed. Here he is in Corinth, right? He's a Jewish man in Corinth preaching Jesus to a bunch of people who were pagan uh, they're uncircumcised they're the people that he avoided at all costs but he can't ever forget the day that Jesus stopped him and revealed to him who he really was and Paul would say to the Corinthians like look okay I, I'm not going to I'm not going to argue theology with you I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to argue race with you I, I'm not going to I, I'm, I'm not saying that we are Jews are better. I, I'm just going to tell you that God is patient. And he is so kind that he saved me. And what the Corinthian people should have heard in that is, they should have heard, he saved me too. He saved me too. And it's right there that Paul would say, now let me tell you something. The love of God rejoices with the truth. So it's not flimsy, it's not gracey, it's not greasy, it's not, it's it's deeper than that. When he says love, he means the love that he encountered on the way to Damascus. When in the name of religion, he was killing people. And so I want to just share with you these verses again. If you would just take a moment and stand with me as we close today, I want you to hear these words one more time. 
And I really don't expect you to go out of here and say, Pastor said, we've got to work on our love. We really just have to be, we just have to try to love people more. That's not what I'm saying at all. I just want you to hear these words. And when you hear these words, I believe that God wants you and me to go out of here confessing these words in our world. You, you, you can tell people, look, I'm, I'm not where I should be. I'm not the love that I ought to be. But let me just tell you this. Well, look, can I just read it to you? In 1 Corinthians 13, could I read to you what I now believe with all my heart, that love is patient. And love is kind. Is not jealous. Love does not brag. Is not arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked or some translations insert the word easily provoked. I think that there are many things that should provoke us into action, especially injustice, but not easily provoked. Some people are just provoked all the time. Does not take into an account the wrong suffered. Does not rejoice in unrighteousness. But love rejoices with the truth love rejoices with Jesus grace and truth when he came he showed us two incompatible things grace and truth because if you got truth it always finds your sin but God's grace is attracted to sin. So Paul would say, where, grace, where sin abounds, grace now much more abounds. Love rejoices with the truth, and so it bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. And I know that it's not the best translation. I, I, I like the phrase that says, love never ends. But, but I, I, it, it never fails either. It works. Love, the love of God works. It worked on me. The love of God worked for me. The love of God worked for Paul. Now, I wouldn't put myself anyway in his camp. But I, I'm going to just tell you that the love of God can change the hardest heart transform our minds so father we come before you today in the wonderful mighty mighty name of Jesus recognizing that he is the truth truth has a name his name is Jesus love has a name his name is Jesus hope has a name. His name is Jesus. Father, I thank you for doing what I could never do, giving up a son. Precious and beloved. For people who are jealous, for people who are braggadocious, people who are arrogant, people who are rude people who seek their own people who are always provoked and always angry always rejoicing in unrighteousness but because your love is patient and kind because your love rejoices with the truth you confronted our human condition with all of its beauty and all of its problem with all its hurt with all its pain with all its potential you confronted us right where we are and revealed 
revealed to us the love of God. And now that love has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. God, it's my confession that on the earth we need the Holy Spirit to fill us with the love of God. We need the Holy Spirit to refill us with the love of God. We need the Holy Spirit to make us full of the love of God. We need the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us and to direct us into a more excellent way, the way of love. So I'm asking right now, Father, for another revival, another outpouring of your Holy Spirit. I'm asking for what one wrote about in York County in 2010 or so. It would be true of this day that right now, right here, when we need it the most, that the Spirit of God would be poured out again.